Well, greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and welcome to Online Worship with Ramona Avenue Christian Church. Uh, I'm Dr. Matt, and you may have noticed something. I'm not in my home office. Yeah, I'm here in our, our lovely sanctuary, um, but I am social distancing because I am the only one here, and it might sound a little echoey, and that's probably why. So I want to welcome you, though, and uh, whether you're finding us for the first time or you've been with us for a long time, uh, I pray that this time will enrich your faith and, uh, and your life. So we have a, a few things going on in today's service. Uh, we will be taking communion later, uh, as we usually do. So if you want to go find a, a bread of some kind and, uh, and some sort of drink, then we can partake together. Also, we will be having... Uh, some special music again today. This is uh, uh, Wes is going to play a piano piece for us. Uh, it's called The Glory. It's from the musical The Civil War. And so um, with this being uh, 4th of July weekend, Independence Day weekend, I um, thought it was fitting to play this piece from uh, the musical The Civil War. And then I've found a, a number of images, uh, mostly from the Library of Congress and a few other places to go along with the uh, with the music. So we have that coming up as well. As we move into our time of worship now, I invite you to join with me in a um, breath prayer. And this is that ancient form of prayer where we breathe. And as we breathe, we think of or speak a phrase, just a phrase. So I'll start with it. Well, the phrase we'll use uh, today is heal our land. Seems like a good one for uh, this weekend. Heal our land. So I'm going to start with a couple of, of deep breaths. Heal our land. 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 Amen. Now invite us to join together in the Lord's Prayer in song. Well, church, as we come to our time of prayer, 
as as always these days, there's a lot. There's a lot going on. Um, but this weekend is Independence Day weekend, right? Happy July 5th. You're watching this the day after July 4th, unless you're watching it later. And so on this weekend, we think about the birthday of the country. We think of uh, the, you know, the blessings of liberty and so on. So many, for so many in this country though, uh, July 4th isn't, it's kind of a, a day of, of mixed feelings, a day of a bit of internal struggle or conflict. Because for many in this country, the promises set forth in our founding documents, the promises of equality and justice and so on, have not come to fruition. I'm reminded of what one thing that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. says in his uh, I Have a Dream speech. He talks about a promissory note, that these promises that all are created equal and endowed with these inalienable rights and so on, that this is a promissory note. And the Constitution itself is a sort of promissory note for what is coming. And uh, it sets out a, a vision that even in its original crafting has issues. You know, written into those documents were a variety of things, right? in, including the exclusion of women, of minorities. It was basically a constitution originally for white males with some wealth, primarily, right? But over the centuries of our country's existence, it has moved closer and closer to the ideals actually laid out in those founding documents. And so this weekend we think about that, or at least I'm thinking about it, and I want to pray for our nation, pray that, that we will move ever closer to the ideals that we've set out for ourselves, that we would actually live them out. Our General Minister and President, uh, Terry Hord Owens, has been calling us to be the church that we say we are. And I think today, I want to pray that this country would become the country that it thinks it is or that it says it is. Um, at least the, the country it wants to be in its mind somehow, right? but we're not there. And so pray for wisdom and, uh, as leaders uh, wrestle with how best to move this country forward. And we're also coming in the midst of, of course, the pandemic, and then also these calls for racial justice, for the end to police brutality, to um, expanded services for people so that they aren't killed for mental illness, for example. And so all these things are swirling in, the, in our minds, in our hearts. What is, who is the flag for? Who is the American flag for? It's a good question to ask ourselves. And there's plenty of other things going on in your own lives as in mine. And so we want to hold all those prayers up before the Lord our God. And so let us pray together. Oh Lord God, on this weekend when we remember the birth, the beginnings of this nation, we come celebrating the good and grieving the bad. So many ways this nation has fallen short of its ideals, the, the, the concepts that drove its formation. And some of the forces that drove its formation, we want, we want to get rid of. We want to rid ourselves of. And so God, we ask for your help in that, that we would become a more perfect union, that we would become uh, who we think we are. And God, likewise, the church has not always lived out its message, has not always lived out of a place of 
justice in Jesus. The two J's. God, help us to be the church that we say we are, to be the church you have called us to be, to be the body of Christ in this world. God, give thanks for the blessings that you've given us. And we ask forgiveness for the so many ways we have fallen short, individually, in our communities, and as a nation. Forgive us for the sins of racism and sexism, the ways that we built systems and structures in our society to exclude people who were not white, male, wealthy people. Forgive us for those things, and God, help us on the path of a true repentance that changes the way things are so that they can be the way you would have them be. Because God, ultimately, our allegiance is to you. And so let it be on earth as it is in heaven. Help us to have a vision, to have the imagination and the courage to build your kingdom, to make your kingdom more like this place, really to make this place more like your kingdom. God, we lift up all of our prayers and our thoughts to you, the one who holds us all. In Jesus' name, amen.
The scriptural selection today is from Matthew 11, verses 16 through 19 and 25 to 30. But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. On July 5th, 1852, Frederick Douglass gave a speech that became known as the What to the Slave is the Fourth of July speech. He gave it the day after the Fourth of July, thinking back on the festivities of the previous day, and a lot of the speech had to do with how the promises of liberty and freedom and justice that the U.S. celebrates on the 4th of July were not a reality for the enslaved population of the country. And he used it as a jumping off point to argue for the end of slavery. Just over a year ago, on July 4th of 2019, Ibrahim X. Kendi, wrote an essay for The Atlantic entitled, What for Americans is the Fourth of July? Where he expresses a lot of the same kind of sentiments that Frederick Douglass did over a century earlier, looking at the injustices and the disparities of our society, even after all the progress that's been made. And so today, the question that comes to my mind is, what to a Christian is the 4th of July? I think it's really presumptuous of me to even try to answer that question. So I'm not really going to. But I want us to think about that question as, I, as we dive into the scripture today. What to a Christian is the 4th of July? Now, the scripture doesn't seem to have anything to do with that at first. Uh, Jesus starts off saying, what should I compare this generation to? They're like children sitting around in a marketplace calling to one another. And then this little quote, he says, we played the flute for you and you didn't dance. We wailed and you didn't mourn. It's like you're not matching or you're not doing what we're expecting you to be doing. And then he applies that to himself and to his cousin, John the Baptist. He says, for John came neither eating nor drinking. Okay, because John was a very much of an ascetic, we call it. He was renouncing the things of the world. He says, he came neither eating or drinking, and they say, he has a demon. For the Son of Man, so the Son of Man came eating and drinking, right? Jesus' first miracle was at a wedding made wine, right? Son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, friend of tax collectors and sinners. 
And then one of my favorite phrases in all of scripture, I think, yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Now we skipped on a few verses then and got into the nice um, kind of happy feeling passage of, you know, come you who labor and find your rest with me. But I want to sit with that first part for a while today. Because what comes right after that? Well, we'll get to it in a minute. Think about this. What's going on here is people are reacting to the way that Jesus is presenting his message. He's presenting his message as he is going to town to town and he's eating and he's drinking in people's houses, right? A lot of Jesus' ministry takes place around the table. John the Baptist was this weird dude out in the desert wearing the strange clothes and eating bugs and honey and preaching, repent, the axe is at the root of the trees. And he says, my cousin was doing that. And that wasn't, that wasn't appropriate. He has a demon. I come eating and drinking, meeting people where they are in their homes, bringing people in, breaking the social norms, of course. And people say, oh, he's a glutton, a drunkard, friend of tax collectors and sinners. So what's the issue here? The issue here doesn't sound like it's so much about Jesus' message, right? It's about the way the message is presented, the way he's giving his message, right? John the Baptist did it this way. I'm doing it this way. And neither one will get through to you. And it's not that you're dismissing it because of the message. You're dismissing it because of the messenger and the way that it's being presented. Now, what happens next? The very next part of the scripture, which wasn't read, is it says he began to reproach the cities in which most of his deeds of power had been done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazan. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For the deeds of power done in you had been done in the Tyre and Sidon, they would have re repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Right? This is talking about a couple of towns in Galilee and saying, hey, these pagan towns, if I'd done pagan, the things I did in your towns, up in these pagan towns, they'd have repented. But I tell you, on the day of judgment, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? This is where Jesus centered a lot of his ministry. No, you will be brought down to Hades, for if the deeds of power done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you, the day of judgment will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom than for you. Now, what is it about that statement about the... About them not accepting the way he's bringing the message that leads into this condemnation of these cities. Well, Jesus had done powerful miracles in these cities, right? But the people didn't respond well. They didn't repent. They didn't come around. And so Je Jesus says this thing. He's like, John the Baptist came proclaiming it in this way that you, you think you would accept. It's, he's being very ascetic and so on. I come and I'm like, okay, I'll join you in the parties and we'll do it that way but you still won't receive the message. And I've been thinking about this passage and it has been gnawing at my mind. And I cannot get out of my head the connection to the protests that are happening now. People are protesting, sparked off by, in this instance, it was primarily sparked by the, the death of George Floyd under the knee of that police officer who had his hands in his pockets for so long. And people are outraged, and rightly so. And so there's protests happening, and there's other people saying, that's not the way. And some of the protests turn to violence. There's pretty good evidence that some of that, at least, was spawned by uh, 
white supremacists and police officers sneaking in and doing some of the damage, but people catch on, you know, it becomes a mob mentality. And we say, well, this is not the way. Protest nonviolently, right? Like, just like MLK. Well, how well did that work out? I mean, yes, we got some change, right? Civil rights law and so on. But what happened to MLK himself? He was assassinated. Because he started to speak out, not just against racial injustice, but against economic injustice, which also had to do with poor white people. And then the powers that be start to really shake. If the poor people join together, there's so many of them. And this is what we do. We say, well, I, I see what you're getting at, but I really wish you would tone down the rhetoric. Or you, you need to really condemn those people who are doing those, who are looting. Or you need to, to be more nonviolent. But then when you are nonviolent, you still get thrown in jail and you still get beaten and you still get hit with hoses and dogs and all the other things. And even if you don't resist the police, you might still end up on the ground with a knee on your neck crying for your mom because you can't breathe. How is the message going to get across? Jesus came to proclaim this message and he brought it. John brought it one way, he brought it the other. In the end, they both were executed because of the things they said that challenged power. Both of them were killed. The ascetic in the desert, was beheaded, the preacher of justice and inclusion at the table and eating and drinking was hung on a cross. The people in power don't want to hear the message. It doesn't matter how it comes. This, to bring it around to the US and this weekend, right? July 4th, 1776, marks the Declaration of Independence from England. And England said, oh, well, that, that wasn't, hmm, okay, I guess we won't have those colonies anymore. No, of course not. They came at them with, that was the Revolutionary War, right? The, there was a war. It started, but it started, remember, as a bunch of revolts the Boston Tea Party, all these other kinds of revolts. There were, some of them were violent, some of them were nonviolent. Some of them were destructive of property and some of them weren't. But in the end, it turned into a full-scale war and this country was formed out of that. Protest, resistance, and revolution have been part of this country's DNA from the beginning. Speaking truth to power, has been part of Christianity from the beginning. I'm not trying here to conflate church and state, I'm not trying to say they're the same, but there is a thread of justice, of the increasing acknowledgement and, and allowing of freedom and justice for all in this country's history. And it has almost always come about by protest, and resistance and revolution. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. I come eating and drinking, being ultra inclusive, bringing people in, bringing people together and speaking about God's kingdom. And he got himself killed for it. His cousin John did it a different way, but still got killed. How does the message of the gospel, the message of justice, the message of what God actually wants for the world, how can you express it in a way that's not going to ruffle feathers? I don't know that you can, because it's a radical message that really has to do with the upending of society. 
and the prophetic voices that we're hearing out of like the Black Lives Matter movement and other movements for justice are prophetic movements. They might not have the name of Christ attached to them, but they are in the vein of what Christ is doing. Again, I'm not trying to co-opt these movements and I'm not letting them, I don't want, they're not co-opting the church, or any, I mean, they're not trying, but we do have similar goals. A kingdom of God, a, a society where all are equal and treated equally and justly. And Abraham X. Kendi says in his article from last year that freedom is the result of power. He says that freedom doesn't come first, power comes first. That you have to have the power to make choices, not just the power to make choices, but the, the power to create choices. The power to create choices. And so by keeping people out of power, who are poor, who are black and brown skinned, people who are indigenous, women, keeping people out of power keeps them unfree. And people only get freedom once they have some power. Because once you have power, then you can create opportunities. Then you can create choices. Now, what does this mean for the church? As we look at this moment in, in our history, what does it, what to the Christian is the 4th of July? Another thing that Kendi talks about in this article is the idea of passive versus active patriotism. It says that a passive patriotism is a patriotism that um, glosses over the, the bad things and just latches onto the ideals, the so liberty and justice for all, and celebrates those things as if they were real things that actually exist in this country. Active patriotism calls the country toward those ideals and doesn't let it off the hook. I think you could say the same in a way for passive and active Christianity. Many of us, maybe most of us, are maybe more in the, in the passive Christianity camp. Christ has done the work. Yay. We're saved, and we bask in the glow of Christ's presence and life and light. But active Christianity, active Christianity, takes seriously the teaching that the Holy Spirit has given to us for our sanctification, to make us more and more like Christ. And in becoming more and more like Christ, we do and we start to act in the ways that Christ did and acted. And to say the kinds of things that Christ said. To be inclusive, to reach out to other people, to bring them in. To bring good news to the poor, recovery of sight to the blind, the release of the captives. Wow, mass incarceration, anybody? Release the captives. The proclamation of the day of the Lord's favor. An active Christianity looks for opportunities to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, like Paul says, to move towards sanctification, becoming more and more Christ like, which will inevitably involve expanding our vision of who is worthy, of who is welcome, of who is desirable, of who is the image of God. So what for a Christian is the 4th of July? Probably not what you expected in this sermon. 
But I think there's something here for us all to wrestle with. What does it mean for us to work toward the ideals of this country as citizens, as people who live in this country, but more importantly, what does it mean to live toward the ideals that Christ set out? What does it mean to be active in our Christianity and active in our patriotism? Let's pray. God, we thank you for this word about how the message was presented and people didn't accept the way it came across. God, help us to keep speaking your truth to power, your truth to one another, regardless of the method and the consequences. God, protect us from harm, but help us to be real and to be active in our Christianity. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. And now I invite us to sing together, Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory. And this is uh, often known as the Battle Hymn of the Republic. And for a long time when I heard this song, I thought about all that militaristic image, imagery of, and God marching and tramping out the grapes. And it just seemed like this so such a militaristic song. And then I learned something. And I have to credit Jenny for, for turning me in this direction. What we call the Battle Hymn of the Republic, My Eyes Have Seen the Glory, was written by an abolitionist woman during the Civil War. Go look it up. Written by an abolitionist woman during the Civil War. The tune comes from an earlier song um, John Brown's Body, which is about John Brown, who is another abolitionist um, who, was, who was killed in, in the, doing some of his work. And so this woman wrote this song as an anthem for abolitionists, for an anthem for people seeking justice, for enslaved people, for black and brown people in her country who were being horribly mistreated. And so listen to the words of the song with that in mind. It's, it draws on all these images from the prophets about God coming in and, and laying down judgment and tramping out the grapes and the juice flows. And there are passages in, in books like Nahum and some of the other prophets about you know, blood flowing in the streets because God has come to do justice. She was drawing on those images when she wrote this song. It's a song about how God's justice is coming for people who are enslaved. Toward the end of the song, there's a line, as he died to make us holy, let us die to make all free. And I in the past had thought of that in, again, kind of militaristic terms that we're thinking of, you know, military going out to fight for freedom. But what she meant when she wrote that song was dying for the cause of abolition, was dying for the justice for black and brown bodies. And so as we sing this song, let us think of the intention behind it and the context, and pay attention to those words.
Welcome to Christ's Table. Wherever we are gathered around the bread and the cup is Christ's Table, and so Christ invites us and calls us to come. Let us pray. God, pour out your Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of food and drink, that they may be for us the body and blood of Christ, so that we can be the body of Christ for this world. Amen. On that night so long ago, Jesus took some bread and he gave thanks. Blessed are you, Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And he gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this to remember me. And then, in the same way, he took a cup, and again he gave thanks. Baruch Adonai, Elohim Olam, Borei Puri Hagafen, Blessed are you, Lord our God, ruler of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. And he gave it to them saying, Drink, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. And I tell you the truth, I won't drink again of the fruit of the vine until I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Christ, you have invited us to your table, and we come with gratitude and thanksgiving. Now let us share together. This is the body of Christ, broken for you. This is the blood of Christ, shed for you. Thanks be to God for the gifts of God for the people of God. Our hymn of invitation today is Lift Every Voice and Sing. And uh, this song is known as the African American National Anthem. And so on this Sunday, uh, it seems appropriate to sing this. And as we sing together, this is our time to commit ourselves and recommit ourselves to the God who calls us out of our passivity into action in the world. And so let us sing.
And now may God be above us to watch over us. May God be beneath us to lift us up. May God be ahead of us to lead us. May God be behind us to push us. May God be beside us to walk with us. May God be within us to love us forever. Amen. Thank you.